Hello, and welcome to PubK's 2022 Government Contracts Annual Review. We're thrilled to have had more than 3,000 session registrants for this annual review. This is our final day of the 2022 Annual Review. We've hoped you've been able to join us for many of the 10 sessions we've already held. We have our final two sessions this afternoon. My name is Alan Schwachin. I'm the president of the PubK Group and a partner in the law firm Nichols Lou. I'll be your host, facilitator, and moderator for the annual review. And I hope that next year we'll be able to reconvene in person. The PubK Group consists of three newsletters, PubK Law, PubK Compliance, and PubK Cyber. Many of you are already subscribers to one or more of these publications, and we very much appreciate your support. If you're not subscribing to all three, I hope you'd consider doing so. Some of you joining our sessions today are not yet subscribers. I hope you'll be con consider becoming a subscriber, maybe to even all three of these publications. Information is at the website shown on the slide and is available from any of the contacts you have here at the PubK Group. This conference would not have been possible without the strong support of our event sponsors, all of whom are listed on these next two slides. I encourage you to look at the skills and the capabilities that all of these firms have. In addition, in lieu of speaker gifts and in honor of our sponsors, PubK is making a contribution to the Capital Area Food Bank. I hope you'll consider making an individual or an organizational contribution as well. Since the entire program is being held virtually, all attendees will be in listen-only mode. Your video will remain disabled throughout the session. But we do welcome your questions. Use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. However, with so many attendees, it won't be possible to answer all of the questions in real time. We're capturing your questions and we'll endeavor to answer as many as possible at the conclusion of the annual review. All presentation slides, along with the audio, will be available for download from the PubK Group website, probably early next week or so, uh, following the conclusion of the full annual review. We'll send an email when this information is available for download, how to access it, and for how long it'll be available. I encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn. We'll have information there as well. I encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where a lot of this information will be shared as well. We're also applying for continuing legal education in a number of jurisdictions. While we cannot guarantee approval, we expect that acceptance within the next few weeks. Again, we'll notify all attendees when those approvals have been received. Finally, if you're interested in obtaining CLE, please look for our poll question during the presentation. The state boards require us to verify your participation during this event. The poll is a simple yes, no, and we'll track the responses to verify that you viewed the panel. If you do not wish to obtain CLA credit, you can disregard the poll or just answer for fun. Now, I'm thrilled to continue the seventh PubK annual review with our session 11 panel on False Claims Act, FCPA, Fraud and Enforcement. Our distinguished panel members are Andy Liu, Nichols Liu, Aaron Beasley of Bradley Aaron Bolt Cummings, Reggie Jones of Fox Rothschild, and Jen Short of Blank Rome. Andy, over to you and the panel. Thank you very much, Alan. And it's a pleasure to be here with uh, you all again this year. So we have about two hours to cover an entire year's worth of developments in the area of fraud and enforcement. And we are gonna do our, our best to try to cover the, the top developments in this uh, relatively short time period. So uh, in our two hours, what we're gonna cover are the new DOJ initiatives uh, and some updates on some um, ones that were uh, implemented actually last year. Uh, the key case law developments, some new DOJ guidance and enforcement trends, some legislative developments. And uh, at the end, we'll talk a little bit about what our uh, projections are for what we're going to see this coming year in, in 2022. So uh, uh, typically, and you can go to the next slide, please. 
Uh, typically, we kick off this discussion uh, with the 2021 False Claims Act statistic that DOJ puts out every year. So they used to put these out every year around November, but it, they seem to be coming out later and later uh, every year. I think last year they came out around January 14th, and we certainly expected that we would have them by January 27th uh, today, but we haven't, uh, haven't seen them yet. Um, so this is probably the latest that, that they've ever come out in, in any given year. I have a colleague that theorizes that, you know, they come out later, later in the year when the numbers aren't as large as, as DOJ wanted them to be. But uh, I'm not really uh, buying into that uh, conspiracy theory. Um, we do have some uh, uh, insiders at DOJ uh, civil, that's uh, civil fraud, who, you know, have projected that the numbers are going to be, you know, maybe in about the $3 billion total recovery range. I, I wonder whether that number is going to be a, a little bigger than that. Um, as I understand it, there's, uh, you know, for example, the, the, the large Purdue Pharma uh, opioid settlement that actually was in October 2020, but would count towards the uh, fiscal year 2021 numbers. And I think that that settlement alone uh, accounts for, for nearly $3 billion in, in terms of how much of that large uh, multi-billion dollar settlement gets allocated to the False Claims Act. Uh, but we'll see. Um, you know, as you've probably heard us say in the past, you know, the numbers are really interesting. The overall big, big uh, total number is, is interesting, but they're, you know, often skewed by these, you know, single huge settlements, right? So uh, this year, I think it'll be skewed by the opioid settlement and prior years, it's skewed by some of the mortgage fraud cases and the like. And so we, we love to kind of drill down <laughs> into these numbers and, and look uh, to see, you know, the total number of cases, how whether you're, we're seeing more whistleblower cases uh, and the like, um, but unfortunately, we just don't have them for you today. Um, I think if you look at the the prior five to six years, um, you know, in terms of procurement fraud versus healthcare fraud or the or the financial industry fraud, uh, if you're looking just at the Department of Defense, for example, we've seen the annual numbers in terms of recoveries range from uh, a low of 75 million in 2020 to a high of 282 million in 2015. And that's just looking at that time period of 2015 to 2020. Um, it's, it's not that the numbers are consistently going down, they kind of swing up and down. Um, but that's, that's kind of the ballpark of what, what we're seeing is, is you know, less than half a billion dollars in, in recoveries relating to, to DOD. Um, so we'll have to, to wait to see the numbers. I think, you know, anecdotally, uh, you know, we have heard that uh, DOJ civil fraud is hiring a lot of new trial attorneys. Um, I think that is both a uh, the result of the Trump administration, during the Trump administration, DOJ not backfilling a lot of the openings that would arise as, as people uh, left DOJ. Um, but I've also heard anecdotally that, you know, the, the Biden administration DOJ uh, is focusing a lot more on corporate fraud. Yeah. So again, we'll, we'll see uh, what it all means. Andy, I was just um, going to chime in. I, every sure. year, I think it's interesting. As you said, the, the top line number is kind of interesting, but it's so skewed by those blockbuster recoveries that it's hard to, for this audience, hard to read in what the trends might be or how things might affect um, you know, the uh, the government contracting industry. I, I feel like there's been a lot of activity over the last year. What I think will be interesting when we do see, see the statistics um, will be to look at um, I know last year when we looked at the stats, the numbers of new cases were up. And in particular, the number of new cases that were being brought internally by DOJ or by IGs. I just know, again, anecdotally, 
I think the the relators bar has sort of been chomping at the bit. And um, as we go through our presentation today, I know at least one thing that that I'll talk about is how many times the government in the last year, DOJ or otherwise, has mentioned the value of whistleblowers. So I can't wait to see what that statistic looks like. How many new cases, how many new KTAM cases versus government initiated cases? Um, and my my prediction, although I'm willing to be wrong, my prediction is that we'll see more um, we'll see that key TAM number rise um, when we see the stats versus I would chime in too. I, I agree with, with what you said, Jen and, and Andy. Um, I, I always like to look at it historically, right? I mean, essentially you have a 150 year old statute that really didn't collect much of anything until 86 and then an uptick. Um, and then really, if you look at it, 2009, you had fraud enforcement and recovery act, uh, that then sort of watered down intent. You don't have to have specific intent to defraud the government. And then the numbers started skyrocketing, right? So 2020 to me marked a number a low, even if you're just looking at the big picture, because in my mind, there just was, there weren't as many DOJ positions filled. There wasn't, for the first time, it didn't seem to matter whether a Republican or a Democrat was in the office, and it was baked into the pie, um, so to speak. Uh, the enforcement was baked in, and the, and the numbers have been, you know, I think what as high as almost five billion in 2014, dropped all the way down to a little bit below 1.7 in 2020. And I suspect it'll go back to the normal, you know. And I think what you were saying is three-ish plus, maybe billion. Three. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it'll be higher. But but again, you know, those numbers are always skewed, right, by by the big ones, and and uh, but. Uh, you know, the other thing to point out is, as everybody knows, is there's there's really a lag, right? When you look at these statistics in terms of, you know, when you're actually seeing the the cases being unsealed and and the like. But I absolutely agree with you all that I, I certainly expect the numbers numbers to go up quite a bit. Um, uh, you know how how and and we'll talk a little bit later about you know COVID and how that impacts uh, things. But I. I do think that we will see in the coming years some some numbers going up. So, so um, why don't we move on? I think Aaron is going to talk about our our first uh, topic uh, of of what DOJ has been doing and and what the White House has done on an executive order. Great, thanks, Andy. Um, so, turning now to the topic of use of agency guidance documents in the False Claims Act context. Uh, gonna, gonna provide a brief overview for you all of where we've been uh, and where we think we're going. Um, so that everyone's on the same page, uh, an agency guidance document is basically an informal agency guidance uh, that usually takes the form of either uh, some sort of policy pronouncement or interpretive guidance. So interpretation of a policy, excuse me, a statute, a regulation, or a rule. Um, now, before 2017, so during the Obama years, the DOJ routinely relied on non-binding agency guidance documents in False Claims Act cases to help establish that the defendant submitted false claims and that the defendant acted knowingly. Um, then we saw a shift when the Trump administration came to town, uh, specifically uh, on November 16 of 2017. Uh, then Attorney Jeff, General Jeff Sessions issued a memo that prohibited, quote, improper guidance documents that sought to bind private parties without notice and comment rulemaking. Then on January 25th, 2018, then Attorney General Rachel Brand issued a memo that stated that the Department of Justice, quote, should not treat a party's noncompliance with an agency's guidance document as presumptively or conclusively establishing that the party violated the applicable statute or regulation. Next slide. So then on October 9, 2019, President Trump issued executive order 13891, quote, to require that agencies treat guidance documents as non-binding both in law and in practice. Uh, then the Biden administration comes to town and on January 20, 2021, 
President Biden revoked Executive Order 13891. Then this past summer, July 1 of 2021, uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland uh, rescinded the 2018 brand memo. And then a couple of weeks later, on July 16 of 2021, the Department of Justice issued an interim final rule implementing Executive Order 13992, which revoked certain executive orders, including the Trump-issued Executive Order 13891. Uh, next slide. So as you'll see, um, what's happened here is essentially a return uh, during the Biden administration to the Obama era policy towards agent, agency guidance documents in the FCA context. Um, and I wanna give you all uh, two main takeaways as a result of this evolution. Uh, first, at present, the Department of Justice likely will be emboldened to try to demonstrate violations by seeking to admit guidance to prove knowledge where a subject has received notice of a rule, even if only informally. And next is the heightened importance of cases like shoot v. super value, uh, which I believe Reggie is going to be talking about in a bit more detail uh, later on today during the session. Okay, on the next slide. One of the developments uh, is the Department of Justice uh, Deputy Attorney General's launch of a new cyber fraud initiative on October 6, 2021. Uh, it's not terribly a great surprise if you followed uh, DOD's evolving cybersecurity requirements and the CMMC program. Uh, you might even consider it a little bit uh, gilding the lily. Um, I think anyone who's been in the Civil False Claims Act and known the world and had to report things, uh, this just, you knew this was probably coming. Um, it's led, as the slide says, led by the Civil Division's Commercial Litigation Branch Fraud Section, and it utilizes the False Claims Act, includes a whistleblower provision, um, directs the, the Civil False unit, Claims Unit to work with the U.S. Attorney's offices and investigate and pursue federal contractors that don't comply with their existing contract requirements. Uh, so it's, it, the, the initiative is, is based not on new law, but rather on the existing Civil False Claims Act, including the FCA's CENTER, you know, our knowledge requirements, which we will worry about on today. Um, it's certainly a little scary uh, because the cybersecurity requirements are, are certainly in a state of flux. I mean, they are transitioning. So I think that's, um, you know, a little bit of what makes this a little scary if you're a business. Now, as you can see from the slide, the initiative's targeting three specific areas. Uh, the first one is whether a company knowingly provides deficient cybersecurity products or services. And essentially what I'm talking about is whether you're complying with the technical specifications in your existing contract. Now, to me, it's a little reminiscent, and I think what you're gonna hear is I'm kind of a historian. I like to look back and know kind of the context. It reminds me a little bit of the 2008 Allison Engine case. Um, that led to Congress's 2009 response with the Fraud Enforcement Recovery Act. Um, that case involved you know, the construction of a Navy destroyer and a sub vendor submission of pay applications that certified the generators they were providing complied with the specifications when they didn't. And the Supreme Court said there was no intent to defraud the government. Congress got angry, uh, changed that and you know, because of mortgage fraud and, and, and healthcare fraud. Um, of course, in, in the process, ended up taking a lot of dolphins in their tuna net, uh, which has kept us as uh, private practice attorneys gainfully employed for quite a while. Um, so that's one. And you don't know what that is. I mean, it could be you provide software and the software doesn't do uh, what you, it's supposed to do. It leads to a breach. Uh, so there, to me, that's a pretty broad area. The, sec the second um, is it's also going to be used for knowing misrepresentation of a company's internal controls and practices. Or the third one is, is, is um, plans, they're planning to use the FCA against federal contractors for knowingly uh, failing to timely report cyber. And right now, in the current DFARS clause, you have rapid reporting, which is 72 hours to report. Um, and that's a little bit scary because certainly you know if you are familiar with your FAR 52, 
20413, uh, your code of business ethics, and you're allowed to do an internal investigation. And essentially, that's been interpreted. You have a reasonable period of time to investigate and report. Um, here, you know, the cyber requirements are 72 hours. Pretty hard to investigate and report. You have a report before you know what's happened. Um, so I, I see there's some risk in, in that. Uh, those last two really relate to the DFARS requirement and certainly only have two hours. But uh, last uh, November, uh, DOD issued an anticipated uh, notice of proposed rulemaking um, that rescinded its cybersecurity maturity model certification, CMMC 1.0. And of course, I published an article back in August of 2020. Then it got all rescinded in May. So I read another article, we we'll read it out there, but they're going to replace it with something called. 2.0. If you're if you're really not familiar with that uh, whole world, if you don't urinate uh, in this stuff every day, there are really four clauses. I won't go into each one, but the DFARS 252.204-7012, safeguarding covered defense information and cyber incident reporting. That's the biggest the other one for use of cloud computing. Um, and unlike the FAR clause, also a FAR clause 52.204.21, which relates to the system, the DFARS clauses actually relate to the information on the system or passing through the system. Um, and right now, what, what would be enforced today is the current DFARS clause, which says you have to comply with NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology Special Publication 800-171, protecting CUI and non-federal systems and organizations. That all relies on system security plans and plans of action and so forth. So what all that means is a little scary because you may not even know the requirements specifically uh, and they're going to change. So uh, that's a long way of just telling you that we knew this was coming. It's a little bit nerve wracking because you don't exactly know what the requirements are. Yeah. Long way to say and Reggie, I'll chime in. Somebody in so a couple a couple questions coming up in the the Q and A or in the chat. One is: Have there been False Claims Act cases in the cybersecurity arena? And answer: Yes, but not many. Um, there in 2019, there were a couple of uh, decisions. Um, one in California uh, for rock. I always say it wrong because it, it, the, it's Aerodyne, Rocket Jet Aerodyne. I always want to say like the Jetsons, but it's Rocket Jet Aerodyne um, where that was effectively um, the category number two of the cybersecurity initiative, knowing mis mis knowingly misrepresenting practices or protocols, so making representations under their DFARS and NASA clauses um, that said they were compliant, there's a whole issue. So, th so that case was declined by the United States, has gone forward through discovery, through summary judgment. Uh, the summary judgment was heard, I believe, last week or maybe even Monday this week, Monday this week, I believe. Um, that case in particular has been interesting to watch um, because the United States has been submitting statements of interest in the case. It highlights, Reggie, what you were saying right at the end about how much volatility and how much change there's been in the DFARS, just in the DFARS <laughs> section, right. right? And the other agencies are, are behind in terms of having... Um, uh, sort of a, a robust cybersecurity, even contract provisions. So the government from a regulatory and contractual standpoint seems to me has been struggling with how to implement cybersecurity regs, which just makes this initiative to me really interesting um, because the False Claims Act, it, we, as we talked about at the beginning, there's this lag between violation filing of a, of a key tam suit or investigation under the FCA and then resolution. And some of these things, and you know, one of the issues in, um, in the Aerojet rocket dying rocket. Yeah. That case um, is uh, you know, what exactly was the government told? There's a, a government knowledge uh, defense that's being raised in that case. Um, 
2019, there was also a settlement against Cisco that falls more into the category maybe of number one, deficient cybersecurity products. There was a glitch in the, the um, cybersecurity products that Cisco was providing. And uh, that case settled with DOJ involved. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot there. Uh, but also falling into that category more recently in D.C., uh, the D.C. District Court um, rejected a, a government declined key TAM case against Dell, um, which was just an interesting case to me because there, as I understood it, the, the relator was saying Dell, uh, Dell products had a, um, a hidden vulnerability that only the relator was able to identify and recover and point out. And um, the DC district court sort of dismissed it a little bit out of hand um, saying that the government isn't guaranteed perfect cybersecurity protection. Um, but it also struck me as if the relator is the only person who knew about it, how do you show a violation you know, of the False Claims Act? How do you demonstrate knowing if there's only one person in the world who can identify it. Last thing I'll say on this, um, uh, I just, I think this is interesting systemically or from a policy perspective that DOJ has chosen the False Claims Act as its chosen tool to go after cybersecurity issues. I'm not sure it's the best tool for all the reasons that I just talked about, um, but it's also a signal and I'm going to flip over and, and talk about the procurement collusion strike force that government contractors are still within the sites, right? Uh, DOJ civil frauds has been so focused in the last couple of decades on healthcare fraud, and I don't think they're gonna uh, get away from healthcare fraud, but these initiatives that really target government contractors, I think um, is interesting. And they're inviting whistleblowers, right? Like, <laughs> tell it, <laughs> like, come bring those cases. So to the extent that uh, we haven't seen too many, I think we'll see more. And I, I think once, it, to me, it's like small business subcontracting issues. That wasn't an issue until it was. Uh, and, and the bottom line is, once it is that once the pump once the pump is primed, uh, they will be rolling. So while I can't point to as many cases, uh, and I think Jen, you picked out the things you've seen. Yeah, uh, it's coming. So get get your get, get everything in order. Yep. And I also cleaned my microphone, so hopefully you can hear me better. <laughs> yeah, I, I think one one thing I'd add. I mean, I think. Uh, uh, you know, when you're dealing with with experts in the cyber area, right? So your your chief, you know, cyber cyber officers and 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 the like. I mean, they they are uh, you know technical experts. They they know the vulnerabilities. They're they're very sensitive about that. They and my experience is that within clients, uh, you know, they tend to be the squeaky wheels, right? I mean, if anything goes wrong, they're going to be on the hook, and so they tend to to you know, making a lot of noise about these issues. Uh, and for that reason, maybe more likely to be whistleblowers as well as if their uh, if their concerns are are ignored. Uh, I for the, you know, as, as Reggie and Jen uh, said, you know, this this is an area where everything is in flux, right, in terms of the requirements and the guidance. And uh, although we've all been predicting that cyber would be this huge new wave and it, and it hasn't yet quite materialized in the way that certainly I thought it would. Um, you know, I think that in the short term, these cases are going to be really messy. So, uh, you know, if you look, for example, at the Aerojet Rocketdyne case, uh, when the defendant there tried to move to dismiss the case, Right at the early early stage, one of one of its primary arguments was materiality, and and pointing to the uh, uh, government's knowledge of of just the widespread non-compliance, right, with with all of these requirements. So the government was on notice, and so it it goes to the issues of both scienter and materiality. Um, and as the court in the uh, in the uh, Aerojet case, you know, found it. The, the relator, uh, you know, had alleged enough to, to move past that motion to dismiss stage. So it's a very costly, costly litigation. Still going. Should we move on? Let's move on. All right. 
And I'll talk some more about government contractors uh, in DOJ sites. So um, probably most people have now heard the Procurement Collusion Strike Force uh, was launched in November 2019. Uh, it's really, it was, it is, was and is a criminal antitrust uh, DOJ uh, initiative. Um, they pulled in OIG's offices, the FBI, U.S. attorney's offices to go after criminal antitrust violations. And they weren't really using civil fraud. At least my understanding is that civil, civil fraud section is not part of the strike force officially. Um, of course, they were, they were brought in on the Korean oil bid rigging cases that were the big settlements a couple of years ago, um, just before the sort of during the period that the strike force was coming into being. Um, and what, what we've seen publicly out of the strike force continues to be criminal enforcement. Um, interestingly, so in, in 2021, the, to the extent that there are trends to be observed uh, of what's coming out of the strike force, um, there's been a, a focus on Market manipulation in the Patel case that's cited here, um, it's, an, it's a criminal indictment, um, and there the allegations are that a bunch of um, uh, aerospace companies were agreeing to divvy up uh, workforce, so skilled engineers, you know, I'll hire these people for this project, and then you get these people for this project. Um, so those are the charges there, and there, there, there's been um, some focus on that type of, of Market, mani market manipulation and trade res trade restraint um, involving labor. Um, and then we also saw uh, in the early fall, I think, late summer, early fall, uh, the G4S Secure Solutions uh, resolution. Um, that is, so the, the strike force was touting, this is their first international uh, case um, under the strike force, because again, the, the Korean oil cases sort of predated the strike force. Um, but here the allegations were that this Belgian security company uh, was divvying up the, you know, engaging in bid rigging um, and uh, to provide services to DOD facilities in Belgium. Um, so those have been sort of the, the strike forces publicly facing uh, developments over the last year. We can go to the next slide. Thinking about how that might affect uh, False Claims Act enforcement. One thing that was interesting, so the director of the strike force spoke at an ABA uh, public contracting law uh, conference in October of last year and was talking about you know, the strike force and, and their efforts. And uh, you know, to, to Reggie's point, you know, you build it and they will come, right? Small business subcontracting fraud, not a thing until somebody says it, it's a priority. Uh, and uh, what he said in his remarks uh, was that set aside fraud and infrastructure fraud are going to be top priorities. Um, so we can imagine that there are going to be some criminal antitrust um uh, investigations there, um, and on the infrastructure piece in particular, um, there was a note in the same speech that that the strike force is also looking at um, fraud against state and local um, governments as well. So that's encompassed within the the strike force. Those are just they're also there's just big money involved, right? So the infrastructure, assuming that infrastructure is a target because there's money going out um, under the the infrastructure bill, we're going to see some civil resolutions now. Whether they come as sort of a tagline to a criminal investigation um, or standalone, we'll see. I can say, like from what I I've seen recently, some DOJ civil activity that seems to be solely civil activity there's an interest in this. And it may be because this is another area where DOJ has been out there signaling, we really need whistleblowers to tell us when there's collusion going on. Um, and uh, in the same October speech, there was praise for whistleblowers coming forward um, to tell DOJ criminal about antitrust uh, violations. 
But those same whistleblowers, if they call Relators Council instead of calling the strike force, might wind up being False Claims Act um, relators. Um, so that's what I got on the strike force. Aaron, you look like you want to add something. Yeah, I was just going to say, noting the praise for whistleblowers, that seems to be sort of a through line in a lot of things we're seeing out of the current administration, whether it's the procurement collusion strike force, uh, the new civil, uh, you know, cyber fraud initiative, mm -hmm. um, consistent praise for whistleblowers and promoting whistleblower cultures is something that we, we keep on seeing, at, you know, repeatedly with this new administration. I think we may come back to that, but let's, Andy, why don't we yeah. move on? Andy, take yourself off of mute. Yeah, you would think I'd have this down by now, right? Uh, the uh, um, next topic is 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 the circuit split on objective falsity, and we and we spoke about this uh, last year too. Um, but the 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 big development really is that you know there were um, uh, the third circuit and ninth circuit cases that went up for uh, to the Supreme Court uh, on writs of. Uh, certiorari and the Supreme Court has declined to resolve the circuit split. Um, but this is such a, a, an important issue that we want to at least touch on it again this year. Um, so this, this is, I think, one of the most notable circuit splits in the False Claims Act area. And, and it's really, it's all about the issue of whether the government and the relator have to prove that a claim is objectively false. Right. And these are cases that have uh, these three are the main circuit court cases, and they've arisen in the in the context of of health care. Um, but the issue is most certainly of great importance um, to uh, government contractors uh, as well. So um, in the Acera care case and the care alternative cases, these were cases that dealt with hospice care. And the question uh, in both cases was whether a doctor's subjective clinical judgment as to medical necessity could be deemed false for the purpose of uh, False Claims Act liability, uh, or whether the claims that had to be supported by facts that could be proven to be ob uh, objectively false. Um, the the Acera care case uh, involve, and, and the uh, care alternative cases uh, had to do with whether uh, hospice providers uh, overbilled Medicare for services for patients who were diagnosed as terminally ill. And uh, the primary issue uh, in the case was this difference of, uh, of opinion between doctors um, as to whether they were actually uh, terminally ill or not. And um, the uh, 11th Circuit had held that uh, there had to be uh, objective falsity, that, you know, a difference, a reasonable difference of opinion uh, between doctors alone couldn't, couldn't support falsity under the False Claims Act. Uh, DOJ had, had appealed to the 11th Circuit and, and, and lost there. Um, but in contrast, the 3rd Circuit and the, and the 9th Circuits uh, have rejected the objective falsity standards. Uh, the Third Circuit was was pretty uh, adamant that the Eleventh Circuit was wrong. The Ninth Circuit, um, you know, was a uh, tried to basically distinguish uh, the Eleventh Circuit case uh, a little bit. But I I do think that you know at the end of the day. You know, the 11th Circuit didn't say that, you know, a subjective judgment or opinion can never be false, right? The question is whether, you know, that subjective judgment or, or opinion is, is reasonable. Um, and so uh, I think all eyes are still on this and we'll see how other circuits are going to uh, come down on this issue. Um, you know, these cases arise in the context of falsity. But I think they really overlap and they dovetail with the cases that also address the issue of scienter uh, in the context of reasonable interpretations of ambiguous regulations. And we're going to talk about some of those cases shortly 
um, and Safeco case out of the Supreme Court that uh, that is a non FCA case, but but I think is is very relevant to the analysis uh, here. So, but again, you know, the big development from last year is the Supreme Court's uh, decision not to, at this time, at least resolve this circuit split. Anybody have any comments on that? And if not, we'll, we'll move on to Reggie in the next slide. Good, I appreciate that. Um, you know, the case here is the Molina Healthcare of Illinois case from the Seventh Circuit. Uh, from last year. Um, it relates to the, you know, as you're going to hear a lot today, the knowledge and materiality requirements of the Civil False Claims Act, uh, and also uh, to the Federal Rule Civil Procedure 9B. So you're going to hear Jen talk about that a good bit, you know, the need to allege fraud with, with uh, particularity and how all of that intersects. So to sort of set the stage, the Seventh Circuit reversed the district court's grant uh, of the defendant's 12B6 motion to dismiss a key TAM complaint uh, where the district court based the dismissal on the plaintiff's failure to allege fraud with particularity under 9B. Um, and, and it's also, you're going to hear a little more about this case too because there's a circuit split with one of the cases on the data analytics issue that Jen will discuss here in a bit. So you're going to hear the, the Bethany Hospice and palliative care case. You'll hear that in a moment. Um, it's also my understanding that Molina Healthcare uh, revealed two weeks ago that it intends to file a, a petition to put the Supreme Court. I haven't seen that. We'll try to track that down. So that may happen. So we may have more things to discuss. Um, it's, it's actually kind of helpful to look at the facts of this case in, in a, you know, sort of a 10,000 foot level. Um, it involved Molina's contract with uh, Illinois' Medicaid program to provide a variety of medical service plans. Uh, and among those, it was required to provide a nursing facility health care plan. You still can, can you hear me? Or is it, I see that some people, if uh, my panel actually can't hear me, just let me know or give me a thumbs down. I'll try to speak as clearly as I can. Reggie, you um, just can't move your head. You got it right there. There's right here. Got to hold right it right here. here. Okay. Okay. Well, the, the bottom line is Molina had to provide a nursing facility health care plan. And part of that plan was that they had to have skilled nursing services as a component of that. Molina didn't have the internal capability to provide that service, so they had to subcontract it out. They did that, but then they terminated that subcontract a year in, and found, but never found a replacement subcontractor and didn't tell the government, oh, by the way, we can't do that anymore. So they continued to get contracts. Um, the whistleblower was actually the founder of the terminated sub that provided the skilled nursing services. So that gives you some concept of what was going on. The relator filed three claims, a direct false claim, you know, saying that Molina submitted fraudulent enrollment forms for each new enrollee in the nursing facility plan after it terminated that subcontractor, right? So it couldn't perform the services, but it's submitting the enrollment form. Uh, and they hadn't found a replacement contractor. They also had a fraud in the inducement count, and you'll hear more about that. But the idea that the government wouldn't have entered the contract uh, had they known that they couldn't receive that particular component of the plan. And the third one was an implied false certification, you know, i.e. Molina submitted false certifications when they submitted pay apps without disclosing it wasn't complying with the, the requirement to provide the, the, the skilled nursing services. So, and I think to, to break it down like, like a potato head, and I don't believe you say Mr. or Ms. anymore, but it helps illustrate the point. Um, you know, there's four elements you're gonna provide, falsity, causation, knowledge, and materiality. Here, the district court had granted the defendant's motion to dismiss on the direct false claim and the fraud and the inducement for failing to show that Molina knowingly did anything wrong, knowingly in the legal sense. And then the third one, the implied certification based on a failure to satisfy materiality. It didn't matter that they submitted those pay apps. Now, you know, not to be too professorial or, you know, or like an elementary school teacher, but knowingly requires the knowledge of the wrongness of the act before you commit it. And, and I think as you all know, certainly all the panelists know, Today, knowingly is not your mother's knowingly, right? 
and it doesn't require a specific intent to defraud the government. It's defined as actual knowledge, deliberate ignorance of the law, or my favorite ball of goo, reckless disregard of the law. And in the direct, um, okay, I'm going to try to speak as loudly as I can. I don't know what to do to try to change my mic, but I'll work through it. Um, in terms of the direct false claim, the Seventh Circuit noted that the relator provided numerous details indicating the when, where, and how, and to whom the false representations were made. And the relator couldn't be blamed, according to the Seventh Circuit, for not having information that exists only in the defendant's files, not something that the relator would have. It was enough in the court's view that the defendant had new enrollees for a service that it could not provide and that the defendant was seeking payment for those services was enough. And then with respect to the fraud and in the inducement claim, uh, the district court dismissed the key TAM complaint because it did not include any details about the contract renewal negotiations. This is a, a contract for services that have been renewed multiple times. And the Seventh Circuit noted the relator wouldn't have access to that information. And such granular detail isn't required under 9B. Specifically, the relator, the whistleblower, set out the beneficiaries, the time period, the mechanism for the fraud, and the financial consequences. It also included, which I couldn't figure out how they did it, deposition transcript uh, from the defendant's chief operating officer that the defendant didn't have the ability or licensure to provide the services, which means the, de the defendant never intended to perform if they knew they couldn't perform. Um, interestingly, what, what I thought was really interesting, it was raised uh, in the, in the uh, seventh, by the Seventh Circuit, the government continued to renew even after it knew about this key TAM complaint. So even after the government knew, so that's an interesting uh, piece. The, the last one was the implied certification, um, you know, where the motion to dismiss was granted because the relator failed to show that it was material to payment in, in making these errors. And the Seventh Circuit founded, excuse me, founded the relator included many factual representations that amounted to material false certifications. One of the examples they used was that the contract included different rates based on the level of care the enrollees got. So skilled nursing services, you got more money for that, uh, which ultimately led, led to that. So those are essentially, uh, that was a lot to tell you and walk through in, in, in granular detail, um, but it's an interesting case. And, and I think it's, it's, it's again, going to knowledge materiality and 9B and how they all fit together, so. It, yeah. On on this particular issue, this case caught my eye as someone who represents, obviously, a lot of federal government contractors who, by their nature, they are inherently sophisticated companies just by virtue of the work they do. And so, you know, very important case, uh, very important case to read if you're a federal contractor. If not, we can move on to the next slide. All right. Um, so this this case, uh, the Lutz v. Mallory case, did not necessarily involve sophisticated players. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> uh, full disclosure, I worked on this case when I was with the government and was on the trial team uh, that litigated the case um, in the District of South Carolina back in 2018. Um, these defendants weren't giving up. They uh, recently had their cert petition denied. Um, so finally, finally, my team won. I'm on the wrong side now to celebrate the win, but <laughs> um, keep this one quick because this is another, it's a healthcare case. And in the healthcare arena, the anti Medicare anti-kickback statute has been um, a principal focus of DOJ over the last several years. The perhaps most relevant to our discussion today um, as we were talking earlier about the policy changes about uh, reliance on guidance documents. Um, I think the Four Circuit's decision in the Lutz case uh, demonstrates that um, defendants aren't going to find, uh, won't necessarily find safe harbor in guidance documents. Um, the That case very quickly involved uh, specialty laboratories that were offering physicians effectively, you know, somewhere between $15 and $30 for every 
lab test that they referred back to the lab. It looked like a kickback to us, uh, this speaking with my government hat on. Um, in between the labs and the referring physicians were uh, third party sales representatives. So there was a company that had that supplied the sales force and they themselves also had employment agreements or, or uh, independent contractor agreements with their sales staff. Mm-hmm. Um, so the government uh, in, in bringing the case, first of all, had an issue with just like these payments of cash to physicians in exchange for referrals of business. And um, there were defenses to that, but they, they didn't work. And, and the labs uh, settled uh, before the case went to trial. So the trial was, was largely against these third party sales reps. And the focus of the four circuits uh, or the appeal and the four circuits decision was whether the agreements between the labs and their independent contractor sales force themselves constituted violations, you know, anti-kickback violations. Um, one of the arguments raised on, and to put it simply, the third party sales company received a cut of the Medicare payments. So they were getting commissions based on revenues. Um, and so the government's theory was that is remuneration to arrange for the referral of covered services. Um, the one of the the arguments that was raised on appeal by the defendants was well there was this agency guidance an HHS OIG guidance document out there that was an advisory opinion. So even then, technically only binding on the, the entity that, that wrote in, but it offered some insights or some guidance um, into when third party arrangements are appropriate under the anti-kickback statute or when they can meet one of the safe harbors. And the, the defendants tried to argue, well, we were relying on this guidance <laughs> and we thought it was okay. And therefore the government can't prove either Center, either under the anti-kickback statute or the False Claims Act. Suffice to say, just cut to the chase, the Fourth Circuit did not buy that um, and just said, look, if you look at the plain language of the anti-kickback statute, this arrangement fits the end. Good luck at the Supreme Court. And they didn't get there. So um, that is my very uh, personally jaded view of that case. I, I think it was appropriately decided um, but it's sort of the flip of not being warned away <laughs> uh, from your bad conduct. Here, the the defense was, well, we tried to comply with this um, uh, this advisory opinion, and how can you sue us now, government? I don't know if anyone else has comment on that. I, I'm probably the worst person to comment on that. So in your view, uh, Jen, how, how clear exactly was the uh, advisory opinion uh, and how closely did it match up with the defendant's conduct? Um, so in the healthcare arena, as I suspect most people know, like the advisory opinion process says in the advisory opinion itself, like no one else should rely on this. Um, but one, it wasn't clear. And as a factual matter, there was no evidence that these people um, that the defendants actually looked to that to try to make their agreements compliant. So just on the facts of the case, I don't think it fit. It was a little bit of a, an ex post argument. Um, again, that's my personal view. Um, but I think, you know, when we get into the discussion on, um, you know, what is, what is being sufficiently warned away or what is sufficient compliance, I could see a different case on a different set of facts where somebody was like, but look, I looked at the agency guidance to form a reasonable belief. Um, and maybe in that circumstance, they might have an argument here. The fourth, the fourth circuit said no. So. It's interesting because to me, it's another example of a case that, that then, uh, you know, there are some parallels to, to, again, the Safeco case, right? And, and whether or not when you're dealing with ambiguous interpretation of ambiguous uh, uh, regulations and, and statutes, you know, whether you look to, you know, subjective interpretation, subjective intent, or, or whether you, you end the inquiry once you've determined that, you know, reasonable minds can differ about the interpretation. 
Yeah. So, okay. Who's up next? We have Aaron. Okay. All right. I think next slide. Great. Um, turning now to developments in fraudulent inducement in the FCA context. Um, so fraudulent inducement is a theory of liability under the False Claims Act, where, for instance, a relator led, alleges that a company induced the government to enter into a contract through fraud, and but for that fraud, the government would not have entered into the contract. Um, if that is established, any claim for payment made under that fraudulently obtained contract can constitute a false claim. Um, and this year, uh, the DC Circuit issued a noteworthy decision on fraudulent inducement and specifically what a relator needs to plead in order to plausibly establish causation. Um, and that case is Simino v. IBM. Uh, and we're going to run through the facts of that case briefly right now. So in that case, the relator who was a former IBM employee alleged that IBM and the IRS entered into a software license agreement, but that upon learning that the IRS was not interested in renewing that agreement, IBM fraudulently induced the IRS to extend that contract. Um, in addition, the relator alleged that IBM collaborated with Deloitte uh, and that this resulted in an audit finding that the IRS owed IBM $292 million for non-compliance with the contract terms. Next slide. Uh, the relator then alleged that IBM offered to waive that fee in exchange for the IRS renewing the agreement. Moreover, the relator alleged that once the new agreement was in place, that IBM nonetheless collected $87 million of the non-compliance penalty by disguising that amount as fees for products and services that were never actually provided to the government. IBM moved to dismiss, and the district court granted IBM's motion to dismiss, and thereafter, the relator appealed to the D.C. Circuit. Next slide. The DC Circuit ended up holding that the relator was required to plead actual causation under a but-for standard. So in other words, but for IBM's alleged fraudulent conduct, the IRS would not have entered into the contract at issue. The DC Circuit rejected the relator's argument that he needed to plead only proximate cause under the substantial factor test. And interestingly enough, the DC Circuit nonetheless found that the relator adequately pled actual causation under that but for standard. Um, so, it, a noteworthy case in the fraudulent inducement context, and in particular on causation, because it clears up the standard uh, that relators need to plead. So, Aaron, can you? Uh, talk a little bit. What was the what was the alleged false statement that induced the IRS to um, renew the contract? Yeah, there was the, the allegation was basically that there was a scheme to the IRS did wa not want to renew the contract, apparently, because it did not use the services as much as it thought it would. And then the allegation was essentially that there was a scheme to sort of uh, come up with a whole bunch of penalties that the IRS supposedly owed under the agreement for uh, use of the agreement sort of outside of its terms. And then that was, the allegation was that that, that, that non-compliance penalty was basically used as leverage to go back to the IRS and say, hey, there's $292 million in penalties that we could charge you, but we'd waive them if you'd renew this agreement. Um, so it was a series of things um, that was alleged by the relator, but that's sort of the gist of the scheme. Um, and again, ultimately, the D.C. Circuit, despite the fact that the relator tried to claim that he did not need to plead but for causation, found that the relator's complaint actually did contain sufficient facts on but for causation for him to survive a motion to dismiss. 
of course, you know, all, all relators are trying to, you know, when possible, squeeze into this fraudulent inducement theory because it's it's how you maximize your damages, right? So, so single damages would be the entire amount of the uh, of the contract under their theory. So, yeah, that's right. Okay. I'm just continually confused by the DC circuit over the years really likes this, but for standard. And I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> Maybe I'm just, I'm missing it. Um, Cause I, I think that discussion is interesting here. And like, you know, relators say, I don't have to plead that. And then the DC circuit says, yes, you do, but it's okay. Cause you did. Yeah. Yeah. That's my understanding of it um, as a as a concept. You know, what is but for causation? How do you plead it oh, like that? Um, <laughs> you want to go yeah, on? The, the DC Circuit's but for causation standard goes all goes back to the SAI, SAIC case, right? From however many years ago that was. I can understand so. it and either, but <laughs> we made it through. I think there was briefing. Um, you, <laughs> should we talk about uh pleading standards, which uh, here is your civil procedure law school exam coming down the pike. Um, but this is interesting. So um, we, Reggie talked earlier about the Molina case as being in this bucket, um, along with issues of materiality and knowledge and all the rest. It's kind of a messy case. Um, but it, one of the issues that it raises is what is the Rule 9b standard in False Claims Act cases. And this one, this is an interesting question. This has come up before the Supreme Court before for decision. Uh, as this group was talking yesterday, and I, I found the discussion of it. So back in 2014, there was um, a case against Takeda Pharmaceuticals that was up on cert, and the Supreme Court seemed really interested in this, you know, or potentially really interested in this issue of Rule 9b pleading standards, um, did what it is now done uh, as of this week, I think, in the, the Helmley case, asked the Solicitor General to weigh in on the United States position on this issue, this 9B issue. Um, back in, in 2014, when the Solicitor General weighed in, they're like, well, yeah, there's a circuit split. The 11th Circuit has this, you know, among others, has this sort of stringent requirement. You have to to show all of the details of an actual claim being submitted to the, the government. Um, but back in 2014, the SG's office said, yeah, well, that's the stated standard, but it seems like there's some softening around that standard in those circuits. Um, and perhaps because the Takeda case was a little bit similar to the Molina case, we'll see what happens here, but it was a little messy, right? So it wasn't just a clear cut, this is why this complaint failed uh, under 9B type of issue, the Supreme Court denied that cert petition, uh, you know, took seven years ago. Um, so now it is back, same issue, back in front of the court in Molina. We'll see how that plays out. But in the estate of Helmley, uh, Bethany Hospice case, um, the decision of the 11th Circuit is now uh, being considered on a cert petition. And the Supreme Court has once again asked the Solicitor General to weigh in. Um, in the 11th Circuit's decision, uh, the 11th Circuit said, look, look, you know, relator, you did not meet Rule 9b specificity. And they were, what the relator had done was sort of this mathematical probability of uh, anti-kickback violation that would have tainted um, claims going to Medicare. So uh, I'm going to get the numbers wrong here, but effectively their analysis was like 95% of the referring physicians to Bethany Hospice are receiving kickbacks and approximately 90% of the patients in the hospice are, are getting Medicare benefits. And so one can reasonably deduce <laughs> that there were false claims being submitted to Medicare for this hospice service. And the 11th Circuit's like, yeah, but you didn't point us to a specific false claim, a specific patient who was referred by one of these, you know, tainted doctors who's getting, you know, kickbacks. And you can't like walk us through even just one example with the who, what, where, when, how um, of 9B. And so you're out. Um, and and um, 
so the case is, was dismissed and the, the 11th Circuit has affirmed. And now the issue that has come in front of the Supreme Court is, I think, in the, the Helmley case, perhaps just more just cleaner um, and more pointed because that was it. Um, that was the, you know, you have to get to, to specific claims, uh, show specific, specific false claims. Um, so maybe the Supreme Court will will take it up if this is the right vehicle, or we might see again that the Supreme Court's like, yeah, maybe this isn't the best case for this. Um, so time will tell. But um, also we'll we'll see what the SG's office has to say about what's happening in the circuit split here because it's earlier, you know, the, the statements from from five six years ago do, don't really ring true. There is a split in the circuits. Um, in other circuits, you would th this might be enough to, to get over the hump. Um, you don't have to have specific knowledge of a specific false claim, but enough um, reliable information to, to support the probability that a false claim was submitted. Um, Does it matter where you get your statistical information? Like, I don't know in Helmley versus Bethany Hospice where they got that information. I mean, it would seem like they, if they knew, for example, X percent was going to was routed a certain way, it sounds like they would have actually had some real documentation to come to that number. Yeah. And if I'm remembering this correctly, the hell, the, that case, the, the Helmley Bethany hospice case really did involve insiders. They just weren't like, they weren't doing the billing, but they had the insider information about, you know, particular physicians and things like that. They, they had at least some basis, or they said their personal knowledge to, to make these conclusions and, and put forth the allegations. Um, contrast that, so thank you, Reggie, for the lead-in, to the IntegraMed uh, case, um, where, you know, IntegraMed Analytics, the relator, is an outside, you know, analytics, claims analytics firm. They looked at Medicare claims data and identified outliers, including Providence Health and Services, and said, these people are outliers. And so we, Integramed Analytics, the relator, has, we've just decided that this portion of their claims is fraudulent. And we've defined the fraudulent claims, and, you know, that's sufficient. Um, and here, you know, the Ninth Circuit said, well, that's, that's not enough to get you over a false claims hump. You know, your own professed, like we attribute these, th these outlier statistics um, to, to fraud, um, don't, don't get you there. Particularly when um, the defendant in that case was able to articulate an alternative explanation for why its claims were outlier claims um, at the time. And effectively it was, well, the rules had changed on how to bill for this condition. And we were ahead of the, the national billing trends. We hired a consultant to help us, you know, make sure that we were complying. Um, Many years ago, you know, DOJ had the, the pneumonia upcoding cases that sort of started out the same way, and the consultants were bad guys. Here, the court's like, yeah, you know, they hired a consultant to make sure that they were following the reimbursement rules, and so maybe they were just better at billing than their competitors. And the relator didn't have an alternate explanation that would cast doubt on lawful conduct that explained away or potentially explained away uh, uh, the the fraud, the self-pronounced fraud. Um, so interesting case. Um, and I think consistent, you know, if, if the government had investigated this and decided to intervene, I think we would have different results. But, but this is you know, for those outsider relators who are relying solely on data analytics, that is not going to be enough to get you to discovery. And yeah, right and that's, you know, I mean, I think like we're, we're seeing this whole data analytics and, uh, you know, data sampling issue arise right now in the 9B context. My own, my own view is that it shouldn't be, be able to be used uh, exclusively to, to get past the 9B hurdle. But then the next questions are, right, 
you know, to what extent can you use data sampling, data analytics to uh, establish liability and to establish damages? Right. Right. And I and I think that there's there is not a consensus uh, amongst the courts on on those issues yet. So. Yeah, well, and it'll be interesting to see again, I think if if the Integra Med cases if the government investigated, found found evidence in addition to the statistics that there was these outliers, um, they were fraudulent claims. And something in addition to, to pure analytics, we would have had a different, we'd be talking about something else. We might be talking about a, a FCA resolution um, of those cases. I think it's just hard for a relator to, to go it alone on that alone. Right. But we shall see. I'm going to toss it back over to Reggie to talk about Safeco. Thanks, uh, Jen. And I think let's go to the next slide if we could. Perfect. Uh, shifting back to the theme that we've hit on many times, of what knowingly actually means under the False Claims Act, um, the 2007 Supreme Court Safeco Insurance Company of America versus Burr is an important case. Um, and I think, as you can see in that case, the Supreme Court held that under the Fair Credit Reporting Act's common law, Sienter standard, a defendant does not act with, quote, reckless disregard of the law if, one, the interpretation was objectively reasonable, and two, no authoritative guidance cautioned defendants against uh, that action. Um, it left open the question of whether that same standard applies equally, uh, not just to uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act, but also to civil false claims cases. This ties in somewhat. You can see it's 2007, right? So it's pre-brand uh, memo. And just to refresh everyone's memory, the brand memo, as Aaron said, stated the DOJ should not treat a party's non-compliance with an agency guidance document as presumptively or conclusive, conclusively establishing that the party violated the applicable statute or regulation. So probably some of that tension started there. Um, many circuits have applied the Safeco Center standard, including last year's Seventh Circuit decision in SuperValue, uh, Inc. Uh, in SuperValue, the court affirmed a district court's grant of summary judgment in favor of the defendants. And the defendants in that case were a collection of pharmacies and those pharmacies' parent company. The whistleblower alleged that the corporate parent submitted direct false claims by knowingly file, filing false reports of its pharmacy's, quote, usual and customary drug prices when it sought reimbursement, reimbursements under Medicare Part D and Medicaid. Um, the case involved a novel question for the Seventh Circuit of whether the Fair Credit Reporting Act's Center provision and Safeco applied with equal force to the uh, Civil False Claims Act knowledge requirement. Ultimately, the Seventh Circuit joined four other circuits that found that it does. Um, specifically, the court held that a defendant does not knowingly, in this case, with reckless disregard of the law under the Civil False Claims Act, uh, if it has one of a objectively uh, an objectively reasonable reading of the statute or regulation, and no authoritative guidance caution defendants against that erroneous view. So, a little bit different. Uh, and it raises the question, if there had been authoritative guidance, would the decision have come out differently? If you look at sort of the, the you know, again, I'm sort of like to get into the facts a little bit to make me help me understand it. Um, Super value listed its retail prices for uninsured customers as its usual and customary drug prices, rather than lower uh, discounted amounts that it charged uh, insured customers when it submitted for reimbursement under Medicare and Medicaid. Um, you know, Medicaid regulations define usual and customary as nothing, it does nothing more than as prices charge the general public. So it was that particular short phrase that they had to deter, you know, to, to sort out. Um, when the district court looked at it, it found that those discounted rates fell within the regulations definition of usual and customary and are the rates that should have been submitted. So no harm, no foul. Uh, however, the court applied its version of the Safeco standard and determined that super value did not act knowingly in the legal sense. Um, and of course, this is such a hot topic. In fact, it's so hot, and I'm not gonna claim credit. Deborah, or excuse me, Jen pointed out for me uh, this morning uh, that on Tuesday, um, the Fourth Circuit addressed uh, the similar issue in Deborah Sheldon versus Allergan Sales. Uh, there was an opinion 
uh, a former employee of Forest Laboratories, which later merged into Allergan, claimed that Forest did not aggregate its drug discounts under Medicaid, uh, under the Medicaid drug rehab statute to give its best price to the government and best price is a defined term. Um, what I read this morning, and thank you, Jen, uh, in a two to one panel split, the Fourth Circuit affirmed the district court's dismissal of the key TAM complaint under Rule 12b-6 because, quote, Forrest's readings of the rebate statute was at, le the, at least, at the very least, objectively reasonable, and because it was not warned away from the reading by authoritative guidance, and therefore it did not act knowingly under the uh, FCA. So to me, you have two cases there where they're saying, dismiss the, the, uh, the, the complaint as a whole because the defendant had a reasonable belief and there wasn't any agency guidance that, that would have warned them otherwise. Um, so I don't know if you, if the rest of the team had thoughts on that or, um, So in, in the Safeco case, I, I very much like the Safeco case. I've liked it for a long time, right? Because even, even though it arises in the context of the Fair Credit Reporting Act and, and the, the statute talks about willfully rather than knowingly, you know, it, it also defines willfully as, as including uh, reckless disregard, right? So in that way, uh, the, they really are analogous, and I, uh, I am not persuaded by the arguments that, that try to distinguish away the Safeco case out of the False Claims Act context. So if you assume that, that Safeco applies to the False Claims Act, I think one of the other really important aspects of the Safeco case is that the Supreme Court said, you know, look, if there's an objectively reasonable interpretation, right, that that vitiates the, the scienter uh, uh, issue. And you don't even have to inquire as to whether or not the defendant actually, you know, had the subjective intent, whether it actually held that, you know, uh, uh, objectively reasonable interpretation or whether it, you know, kind of post hoc came but up. I, with I think way. the objectively reasonable, I think the problem comes in with the, is it objectively reasonable that they didn't have an objectively, that interpretation was not something they had at the time. It's something that an attorney created after the fact. And that, you know, that, that to me is one of the pieces that makes it a little complicated. Yeah. But as I read the Supreme court, you, you know, once you make the determination as an, an, an objectively reasonable interpretation, you only have to look at that subjective intent. And, and in a sense, it makes sense, right? Because otherwise you would have, you know, two two different defendants, right? Each with with the same conduct, right, or interpretation. You know, one liable, one not, right? Ba based on what what one person may have thought within. I know that may not seem fair, um, but it it seems uh, like a reasonable outcome to me. Do you think, Andy, uh, on that same point? Because the, the the four circuit case that, that came out this week was decided on a motion to dismiss. Is that the right place to make that think, determination? Yeah, I do think it's the the right place, and that's and I think that's why you then don't go right to look at the subjective intent, which would require discovery and the like. So, how how does a, a defendant demonstrate other than through legal argument that it had? that there was an objectively it's isn't it just legal? Well, i think you argue over the interpretation right of of, of mm -hmm. what the regulation or requirement means mm -hmm. um and and, and I, I think we do that you know often in our uh in our motions to to dismiss whether you're interpreting a, a far provision or a contract clause or, or in the healthcare context you know any any number of other interpretations so yeah. Well, I think in this particular, in, in, in certainly in the super value case, there just wasn't a whole lot of explanation of what the best price should be. I mean, the definition was about five words. So it, to me, I, I, I don't feel strongly that should have been dismissed. I don't know that it was, you know, because I don't know what you're supposed to, it left it wide open for people to do whatever you wanted to do. Right. It wasn't clear at all. Yeah. Yeah. Reggie, I'm impressed that you got through. Did you get through the dissent? Dissenting uh, in as well. <laughs> I did, and I read. It seemed like the the the, the uh, long. You know, long. It was it was. Well, I saw that email and I ran quickly. I hit, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> well, if, if we're all, we can move over. Uh, I know Jen was going to, or uh, uh, next. Okay. We'll try to stay on stay on track and do uh, our next circuit split. And it, the circuit is splitting, like Voldemort splitting his soul into seven pieces. We're getting circuit splits all over the place on the DOJ's authority to dismiss over a relator's objection uh, under 3730C2A. Um, gosh, this just wasn't an issue <laughs> like five years ago. Who th- but the government is, has taken steps to affirmatively dismiss cases that it's declined. And uh, the relator's bar is, is fighting those efforts. And it's so it's it's interesting, um, and it's interesting from a defense perspective because the the fight is joined, uh, really, between Relators Bar and DOJ. Um, so it's kind of fun to watch other lawyers fighting over False Claims Act language. Um, so just to to set the stage, coming into uh, the Granston memo and and talking about C2A authority and yes, we're going to exercise this authority in the appropriate case, you know, largely in the the wake of of Escobar and and potentially rising uh, burdens on the government. Um, There were were two standards that were out there. Uh, There was the DC Circuit SWIFT standard, which effectively said, hey, the government can do what the government wants to do. This is, you know, the United States case. And if the United States doesn't want to prosecute the case, they can dismiss the end. Prosecutorial discretion, broad, really fairly limitless. Um, and then the Ninth Circuit had the Sequoia Orange Standard, which was a little bit, I don't, it gave maybe the, a very narrow opening to uh, relators, but the, the government basically had to give a reason that wasn't arbitrary um, for seeking dismissal. Um, there's a lot of discussion a couple of years ago about whether the government has to intervene before it can seek to dismiss or can it do it sort of uh, through its own authority. And the court seemed to generally say that, um, you know, there should be intervention, but we're just going to give that to you, government. You file a motion to dismiss and we're just assuming that you're asking to intervene. And yeah, we're going to go ahead and let you intervene and then we're going to let you dismiss under one of these standards. Um so that was the circuit split. And now, as of last year, the Seventh Circuit came up with a new way to look at this and said, oh, this isn't unfettered prosecutorial discretion and Sequoia Orange isn't right either. What we think needs to happen here is that the government should intervene. And now we're going to look at what are the standards under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 41 so that I guess, arguably, or in this very um, sort of civil procedure, statutory interpretation, um, heavy decision from the Seventh Circuit at the early stages of litigation. So if the government comes in, intervenes, whether or not they call it an intervention motion or not, um, government comes in and moves to dismiss. If the defendant hasn't been required to answer, if the issues aren't joined in the case, it is unfettered. You just, you're the plaintiff, you get to dismiss under 41A. If the case has gone on, then the standard is the plaintiff, the United States can dismiss on the terms that the court sets, which is a little bit fuzzy. Um, but the Seventh Circuit went through this very detailed statutory analysis over the C2A provisions, which are like two lines long. Um, and a lot of sort of what does this mean? How do we interpret these different factors here? How do we make this whole thing work? And at the end of the day, the government gets to dismiss the case. So all of this wrangling to come up with the proper framework leads to the government gets to dismiss the case so far. Um, so the the, the uh, Siminja case, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but the Seventh Circuit decision went up to the Supreme Court on a, a petition for for writ and the Supreme Court denied that, said, yeah, we don't, you know, whatever, we've got three standards out there now. Um, and so we sort of went back to business and the next time it came up was in the Health Choice Alliance case. So the Fifth Circuit looked at this, um, the same issue shortly after uh, the cert was denied um, on the Seventh Circuit case. 
And, you know, in Health Choice Alliance, they basically applied the Sequoia Orange Standard, said, well, the government's got to come up with a reason, and the relator has to show that it's arbitrary, their reason is arbitrary or capricious, or they've abused the process, they haven't investigated, you know, something along those lines, go about their business. Okay, next slide. <laughs> then... The Polanski case comes along and the Third Circuit says, hey, we kind of like the way the Seventh Circuit has done this. And um, they so they adopted the Seventh Circuit approach. So the United States intervenes and then we look at everything under Rule 41. That makes sense. Um, and then they know, well, there's kind of a difference in the way that appellate courts look at this whole issue, just to note that um, if it was a standard motion, you know, substantive motion to dismiss, under 12b6 or what have you, we would take a de novo review, but under rule 41, we look at the district court's decision under an arbitrary and capricious standard. Okay, guess what? The government gets to dismiss at the end of this case. So that's the, the upshot, um, no matter which path you take to get there. So yay, First Circuit chimed in uh, a week ago, last Friday, issued an opinion saying, well, we don't like the Seventh Circuit view at all. Um, we disagree with that. And also, we don't think that the DC SWIFT standard is exactly right, although it's mostly right. And then we really don't like the Sequoia Orange standard either. So we're going to come up with our own formulation of this. Um, and so now in, in the First Circuit, the government's got to give its reasons for dismissal. But the motion should be granted, SWIFTish standard, except giving reasons. Okay, so you got... Anyhow, the, the court should dismiss unless the relator can show that the government is transgressing, transgressing constitutional limitations or perpetrating a fraud on the court. So arguments that might work under Sequoia Orange, like, well, the government didn't really investigate this the right way. They didn't do these things. They're not looking at it. You know, they're, they don't like me, the relator. Those types of reasons won't cut it. Um, but here, the relator at the hearing that's called for under the statutory language, the relator can try to show that the government um, isn't affording, you know, ha has somehow violated due process or is doing something that that really um, uh, something something nefarious, something that that perpetrates a fraud on the court and and thus is more just. Um, it has to be more than just a disagreement with DOJ about how they investigated and the conclusions that they drew. So I don't know how many, I think that's four standards, but we'll see. And at the end of the day, the government gets to dismiss the case. So this is a fun exercise. They're, they're good opinions and interesting decisions if you really like civil procedure and statutory construction. They're fun. They're fun to read if you like those things. Anyone? I'll pass it over to Aaron. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll be I'll be talking about arguably a fifth standard in a moment. So, yeah, get ready. Um, so, turning turning now to the False Claims Act amendments of 2021. So, in the summer, uh, in, in July of 2021, a group of senators uh, led led by Senator Grassley from Iowa proposed a series of noteworthy amendments to the False Claims Act. And we're gonna run through those quickly right now. Um, since that time, um, specifically in October of 2021, the Senate Judiciary Committee has reviewed and marked up those proposed amendments and watered them down uh, a fair amount. And we're gonna talk about that as well. So first, with respect to materiality, the original proposed amendments to the False Claims Act, again from this past summer, provided that the relator or the government may establish materiality by a preponderance of the evidence, and that the burden then shifts to the defendant who can then rebut materiality by clear and convincing evidence. Now that provision in particular has been watered down by the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, in the fall. Um, next, the original proposed amendments contained a cost-shifting provision under which the government could move to require a party to reimburse the government for discovery costs in a case where the government declined to intervene. The requesting party would then have to reimburse the government for discovery costs 
unless it could demonstrate that the discovery is irrelevant, proportional, and not unduly burdensome to the government. Now, in proposing this particular provision, uh, it was reported that Senator Grassley stated that this was aimed at preventing, quote, fishing expeditions by uh, defendant's counsel. Uh, but then in the fall, the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, removed this provision from their version of the proposed legislation. Next slide. So coming back to the, the issue of dismissal, uh, which Jen was just talking about, the original version of the proposed amendments provided that the government should bear the burden of demonstrating the reasons for dismissal and that the relator uh, must have the opportunity to show that the reasons for dismissal are fraudulent, arbitrary and capricious, or contrary to law. Now, the Senate Judiciary Committee has modified this provision as well. Um, and what it looks like at the moment is basically a sort of modified sequoia orange type um, type test, where basically the government just has to show a valid government purpose. Um, and then next, the original proposed amendments to the False Claims Act proposed to amend the FCA's anti-retaliation provisions to apply to any employee. And this was done to address a circuit split as to whether uh, the provisions apply to only current as opposed to current and former employees. And this provision has actually been kept by the Senate Judiciary Committee. And then finally, the uh, original proposed amendments provided that they would apply to all litigation pending at the time of passage, as well as future litigation. Uh, but the Senate Judiciary Committee has since modified that uh, such that the amendments would apply only to future litigation. So certainly a noteworthy development um, and certainly something to keep an eye on. Erin, can I, putting on my defense hat um, a bit on the cost shifting provisions? Yes. We were talking like, first of all, how is this really any different than the standards that apply in discovery and, and aren't the, you know, if, if you've got a good magistrate or a good district court judge, shouldn't they be looking out for those fishing expeditions anyway and, and putting those down? But I don't know how many of us have heard from DOJ and responding to a subpoena or a CID, like this is the cost of doing business with the government. And we're, we know it's going to be costly and burdensome. And you're telling us that there's no there there, but still we need you to produce terabytes of information. Um, so I'm just, yeah, that's right. And I think one of the one of the original criticisms of the cost shifting provision was that it it actually in practice was sort of a nothing burger, that it wasn't really adding anything. Um, and so, you know, that perhaps is one of the reasons why the Senate Judiciary Committee just stripped that all together. Yeah, and pulled it. Um, the I think for for this audience, it's interesting. Again, we'll see if the I don't know if one has predictions on whether or not these amendments will actually get traction, but I think the anti-retaliation uh, expansion of that provision is potentially a, a risk area for government contractors. Um, up and yeah. down. Right. Go ahead, Andy. Oh, I was going to say, I, I, I think that the, you know, anti-retaliation provision is, is the only one that actually, uh, you know, was substantive, right? I mean, to me, on the cost shifting, as Jen, you said, right? I mean, the, the cost shifting it gets triggered whenever the discovery is not relevant, proportional, or is unduly burdensome, but the government can can object to the discovery and try to preclude the discovery at that point anyway, right? right. Uh, on those grounds. And then on the materiality, I, I actually don't really understand um, Senator Grassley's uh, uh, proposed amendment because, you know, under the, the FCA, as it's been amended, the, the government already has to prove materiality of the fraud, right? Alleged by a preponderance of the evidence. And so, uh, yeah you know, presumably, uh, you know, trying to shift the burden to the defendant after the government has already established the element of materiality is kind of, you know, meaningless to me. Uh, I don't know if maybe I'm missing something, but I don't think I am. So, 
Um, and then the, the, uh, on the anti-retaliation, I mean, at least that, that would be a substantive change, right, to the actual act um, to make it apply to former employees as well. Under the, the current, uh, you know, version of the False Claims Act, 3730H, which applies to employees, there, there was a, a great quote in the U.S. XRL Felton v. William Beaumont Hospital case out of the Sixth Circuit. So that was a case that, that addressed this issue of whether or not 3730H applies to former employees. And the, the, the lengthy d- dissent by Judge Griffin uh, begins with the quote, this case asks if the word employee, when used in the False Claims Act, refers to someone who is not an employee. Hmm. To ask the question is to answer it. And then, and then goes on. Uh, but Judge Griffin was in the minority there. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, you know, if I had to bet, I, I, and I said this yesterday when we were all talking, I'd bet on inertia, meaning that nothing ends up happening. But nonetheless, you know, um, important to keep an eye on in case this actually does uh, go through. It seems that, you know, to me that, that, I mean, one, I guess Senator Grassley was the sort of, wasn't he the key architect in 1986? So he, you know, this is just kind of, again, sorry to be the historian, but he, so he, he's continuing with a theme 36 years later, 35 years later. Um, but it does seem he's also a little bit out of step with, with kind of other, the rest of his party on some of these things. So it's a little, little bit, to me, it's a mixed bag. Okay. So we're, uh, we only have about 14 minutes left. So should, should we move on? Yes, you're up. Okay, well, I, I'm actually going to speak very quickly about the next next couple of of, of slides. So that in the in the area of criminal criminal uh, procurement fraud developments, I found m- most interesting, I guess, was uh, uh, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco's keynote address to the ABA White Collar Crime Conference in in October. And and in that um, keynote address, she discussed some of the trends and the priorities of the department relating to corporate crime uh, and describe some of the actions that the uh, department was undertaking to strengthen its response to uh, corporate crime. Uh, I've highlighted here three of the principal issues that she talked about. Um, She announced that to get full cooperation credit, companies have to provide information on all individuals that were involved in the misconduct and to provide all non-privileged materials uh, about that misconduct. And this is really a return to uh, what the cooperation requirements were um, prior to the uh, 2018. Um, And it's really a return to the Yates memo in 2015. In, in 2018, um, the Department of Justice had modified this standard for full cooperation to require only information on those individuals who were, quote, substantially involved in or responsible for the misconduct, not all of the in- individuals involved in the misconduct. So uh, to me, this is just an, another kind of um, uh, example of the department's focus on uh, individuals. It's, it's a drum, I think, you know, many of us have been beating for, for the past few years. The, the focus on individuals, I think, is, is really, uh, you know, the embodiment of the, of the department's view that the best deterrence of corporate fraud is to have consequences for individuals. Right. So so the, the actual misconduct is by individuals. And so to deter them, you've got to have, you know, some some penalty uh, for them. Um, the second thing she announced was uh, that charging decisions will now consider all prior misconduct. The, the justice manual uh, previously stated that prosecutors are to, and it may still to this day, I'm not sure that it's been amended yet, but the, the justice manual says that prosecutors are to consider a corporation's history of similar misconduct when making a charging decision. Um, but uh, the deputy attorney general announced that uh, the Department of Justice is now going to consider 
you know, all other historical misconduct. The ra rationale really being that considering all of the misconduct is what you need to do when trying to evaluate a company's commitment to compliance more generally. And so in, in that respect, I think that that actually does make some sense. Um, and then the third uh, focal point uh, of her keynote was about monitorship. So as many of you know, when companies enter into non-prosecution agreements or deferred prosecution agreements with the, the department, they not only have to pay fines and penalties, but they sometimes have to agree to imposition of an independent monitor who will uh, observe and uh, assess the company's compliance with the uh, agreement and report back to uh, DOJ. Uh, back in 2008, uh, DOJ issued a policy memo on monitors that advised that prosecutors should not only consider the benefits right, of having a monitor, but also consider the costs that the, the monitor imposes and the impact that the monitor may have on the operations of the, of the company. And again, in 2018, the department expanded on that 2008 guidance uh, to say that uh, monitors should only be favored when there's a demonstrated need for one and a clear benefit to be derived from having a monitor. Uh, again, taking into consideration the projected costs and the burden of having a monitor. Uh, that 2018 guidance went on to say that uh, if the company has an effective compliance program in place, you know, it, it somewhat presumes that a monitor is not necessary. The, depart, uh, the uh, Deputy Attorney General, Lisa Monaco, uh, in October made clear that monitors uh, are a useful tool. They are not disfavored. And to the extent that the guidance, the prior guidance suggested that monitors are the exception and rather than the rule, that she would be rescinding that guidance. Um, uh, as she put it, the, the monitors uh, are going to be uh, necessary whenever it's needed to satisfy prosecutors that the company is uh, living up to its uh, compliance and disclosure obligations under the DPA or NPA. Um, so that's, those are the highlights of, of her address in, um, in October. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Okay. Keep going. Keep going. So FCPA. So uh, last year was a, was a pretty quiet year for, for uh, the FCPA. I think in 2020, there, uh, it was a, uh, uh, one of the uh, years of, of larger recoveries and, and greater numbers of, of enforcement actions. But 2021 uh, was, was a year of, of low numbers. Uh, whether they stay down or not, you know, is anybody's guess. Uh, you know, I have a theory that maybe some of the, the, the uh, low activity uh, was COVID related. Um, but we've also certainly heard that DOJ is increasing the resources that it is devoting to the FCPA, both in terms of prosecutors and FBI investigators. And so I think it's a safe bet that we will see these numbers go up quite a bit uh, for 2022. Why don't we move on? And in our last uh, seven minutes or so, talk about what we foresee in this coming year. Uh, Reggie, you want to kick it off? You're on mute. No, I know I had to find the mute button. I've got too many screens. It's, it's exhausting. Um, no, and one thing that maybe hasn't come across your radar that I do think is important, and I'll hit it very, very quickly, is uh, FAR 52-222-50, combating trafficking in persons. I think a lot of companies, uh, when they're looking through their, you know, their contracts or solicitations, when they're submitting a proposal or putting together a proposal, um, because I think, it, you know, in, in your mind, it triggers the idea of procuring commercial sex acts or using forced labor 
Uh, and I think as you look at the slide, I've actually pulled out, there are nine things that that clause prohibits. You see from the, the uh, link that we provided there, Justice said they you know, got 87 million back dollars to combat human trafficking and help victims. Again, I think you're thinking of something more sordid when in fact, if you look uh, around 2015, that FAR clause came into being um, and then it was actually updated in 2018 uh, to actually explain what some of these other items are, but you know, I'll highlight just a couple: engaging in severe forms of trafficking, um, using misleading or fraudulent practices during recruitment of employees, charging employees or potential employees recruitment fees, or arranging or providing housing that fails to meet the host country housing and safety standards. I think the recruitment fees, and I mean it can be, I'm seeing it more and more in contracts. That I'm seeing issues pop up where let's assume somebody, you have a contract where you have to have um, other country nationals, you're hiring people from one country to another country or to do, it could be anything, it could be a law cap contract, it could be anything, um, could be a building project uh, for the State Department, it could be anything. Um, but sometimes you have your contract, you know, you hire people, you send them to a particular place, you incur great costs to get them there. And then you say, well, we'll reimburse your flight, your visa, all that one year after you've been here. Well, that's actually violates that clause. And there are a lot of penalties for that. So it's an area. And then in 2020, DOD IG said, wait a minute, you're not really implying this. We're not sure what you're doing. It's clearly I'm seeing it more and more. Now, there aren't cases. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, but what you do see um essentially is, you know, starting in 2015, you had these six new activities. And then in uh, 20, in like December 20th of 2018, DOD issued a final rule actually defining what recruitment fees are. So then 19, obviously we enter the pandemic, but you're just starting to see that pop up onboarding fees, background checks, medical testing, um, you know, labor certifications, visa fees. And you also, by the way, have to certify. So again, it relates to False Claims Act because not only does it have its own penalties, it has uh, Civil False Claims Act repercussions because you have to certify that you have a program, a compliance pl uh, plan, you've implemented it, you've done your due diligence. Um, so again, I, I see that as an area that, um, you know, like I, I think Jen said, if you build it, they will come. I think that's, I see it coming and I don't think most people and, and maybe maybe the panel because you all are really, really smart. But for people like me, this one popped up and I just I didn't realize what it meant until I really went. deep. So I think this is going to be an area uh, for anyone performing uh, where they're doing things like recruitment fees. Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen any actual false claims act cases that I can recall now, but we we represent a lot of uh, you know contractors that work overseas and 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 overseas contractors, uh, and uh, you know there certainly have over the years been been quite a few uh, investigations that that relate to this to these issues. So, and it is it is only going to continue. Yeah, I agree. Right. Uh, I think if, if you want to do the next couple sure. slides, go to, I can hit private equity very quickly. Go forward a slide or two. You can keep one Sorry. more. There you go. So something that I'm going to hit very quickly because we're almost out of time. Um, a, a trend that we've been seeing uh, and something that we think is going to continue into 2022 and beyond is the intersection of false claims activity and private equity firms. Uh, give you a, a few quick data points. Uh, one, in uh, December of 2020, the SBA announced that over 2,500 private equity-backed companies were approved for PPP loans of $150,000 or more. Uh, we expect to see increased scrutiny in 2022 of uh, PPP loans as more forgiveness applications roll in. So certainly something to keep an eye on. And then the next one, in July of 2021, uh, the DOJ announced a $1.8 million settlement with a private equity firm based on allegations that it discovered alleged fraudulent activity of its portfolio company during a diligence check but that it took no actions to stop it. Um, that general fact pattern there is something to keep an eye on. I think we're going to see that again in 2022 and beyond. Um, and then one more example at the bottom there. Okay. 
So uh, just real quick on, on COVID, I mean, to state the obvious, right? You, you know, anytime you've got trillions of dollars being uh, injected into the economy in a short period of time with a bunch of brand new programs like PPP, the Provider Relief Fund, the, the Main Street Lending Programs, uh, you know, guidance around eligibility and forgiveness uh, changing on a daily basis, you know, as the as the as the guidance was rolling out in the early days of COVID, just a lot of confusion around uh, eligibility, a lot of complexity around, you know, how you apply the affiliation rules and the like. It is just the perfect storm for audits and investigations and cases. Um, and again, with a with kind of the lag time and and seeing FCA cases and the like. You know, we we do expect to to see uh, 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 quite a bit of uh, an uptick in COVID related fraud cases. So, yeah, I'm not sure if there's anything. I mean, telehealth. I, if there's a theme for this audience to take away, or one of the themes that I hope people take away is the the intersection of false claims act enforcement and changing regulations. And that is part of what's going on both with COVID and telehealth. Um, yeah, the telehealth obviously being more in the, the healthcare realm. So we'll just, we'll save it for the next next session with nice. healthcare providers. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so I think we're one minute over. So uh, uh, do we turn it back over to Alan? And thank you everybody. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Andy, Jen, Aaron, Reggie, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. The exchange back and forth, your individual perspectives, very valuable, both uh, former government uh, watching this from the contractor side and private sector side uh, added a lot of value. And I really appreciate the time you took to put the presentation together and make our presentation today. A big thank you to you. And also a thank you to our event sponsors for this event. You'll recognize some of their names uh, on these next two slides. We could have put on this whole program without their strong support. And uh, we thank them for that as well. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>